and and actually before we start i wanted to ask a question of the audience also which is that have any of you been secret fans of something like been such a big fan of something that you don't tell anybody about it how many and why did you keep it a secret just for fun it's just your thing and nobody else's right yeah so i guess there are also two types of fandom which is one which is very evangelistic and you want to tell everybody how awesome this thing you've discovered is and you want everyone to love it and some thing which you want to keep just for yourselves in the film i felt like both the fandoms coexisted because there's there's a widespread fandom of a movie star and a song which everybody partakes of but obviously there's a secret fandom that she's experiencing through which she's coming to know herself much more right and I think the film also shows a kind of flexibility that we see in Hindi, in Bombay cinema, that, um, you know, when, when, when she hears Mere Sapno Girani first, she thinks it's, it's the male singer singing it to a woman. And so she thinks she has to occupy the place of the woman. I want someone to sing that for me. But then as she, as she sees it again and, and realizes her own identity, she realizes that she wants to sing it to someone else. She wants a queen of her dreams. So I think that flexibility is something that, we, is, is significant in Hindi cinema, the idea that you can feel fandom and identification, but it doesn't fall always, it often doesn't fall along neat gender lines. So I identify as a woman, so I could only identify as a woman in the, in the film. Actually, identification crosses some of those lines and produces, I think, really interesting queer um, possibility. I, mean, I think it also crosses lines of sexuality, right? Like, for example, in the case of this film, there is a sense that one's orientation sexually gets expressed through watching and experiencing the feelings which are in this song, right? And slowly identifying with one, then the other, and think, no, no, I'm actually this and not that. But I think that even as a heterosexual person, you might keep crisscrossing your identifications, right? I mean, I mean that's what, is the, what the queerness offers you. Uh, for example, I love Shah Rukh Khan, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I love Shah Rukh Khan because I fantasize about him loving me, even though Devdas is my favorite film, because it's three hours of him saying paro, paro all the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the thing is that sometimes I feel like I am Shah Rukh Khan, right? So, so it's that you both want to be that person as well as imagine that the person loves you and sometimes you just want to love that person and many things. So you yourself experience love in multiple ways, both for yourself and the other person uh, somehow. So I think that is really the ultimate queerness that Bollywood films offer you, uh, especially through song and dance, right? Yeah. I was going to exactly say that. The song sequence is almost a perfect place for that because it's something so physically and emotionally enjoyable about it. It's not like you have to choose a side or you have to you have to hear, a, you have to choose a moral position. It's just about desire. And, and the love song is obviously something that we, that are, there are many, many instances of it. But the, the intensity, the moving between intensity and distance, the choreography, the, the lyrics, of course, and all of it combines into something that is lengthy and is full of affect. So it allows for this play of identifications, even from beginning to end of the song. Yeah, and I think, you know, I feel a bit sad because one of the most vilified aspects of Hindi film has actually been the lip sync song, yeah. right? And people have often said, oh, that movie is really good because it has no lip sync songs, as if that's a sign of superiority. And we are now at a moment in uh, our cinema where you almost never see a lip sync song where people are singing to each other, which is a kind of fantasy that you play out. We always see if there's a lip sync song, it somehow has to be made believable. So it'll be an item number or it'll be some kind of a performance inside the film. But earlier films, actually, because people sang to each other, and that's the part of the film we remember the most. Like, I don't know how many films you remember the films that you've seen, right? But you probably remember the songs, and that the songs play on the radio, and that we used to all watch. There are some people who don't remember, but when we were young, many of us waited every Wednesday for Chitrahar, right? So that you could see the songs and experience those feelings again. So I also often think that even in the most square, so to speak, life, you see people singing songs, and when they're singing film songs, when they're playing Antakshari, they're suddenly becoming the thing that the song was, right? I don't know if any of you have uncles who are very good at singing songs that are meant for female parts, mm -hmm. and sometimes performing those female parts, right? Like, my dad would always perform Helen in Aja, what is it? Aja, that song, right? Konika, oh my darling. And it was a kind of item he did in every family function. And so I just think that, it enables his everyday queerness as well, very effortlessly, without you having to say that I identify one way or the other. 
we should we talk a little bit about what we think queerness is? Yeah, so often when we say queer, um, it's associated with, um, with same-sex love and same-sex desire and same-sex sexuality. Um, and so we just, we're, as you've noticed, we're using the term slightly differently than that. Um, really to think about queerness as opposed to normativity. And normativity, and these are great slides that Agents of Ishk made um, to kind of to talk about what queerness is. But we, opposing queerness to normativity, I think op gives us a, a, a way to talk about lots of, ra a range of desires that don't necessarily need to be classified or are, don't, need to, don't need to be put into a certain kind of category. And by normativity, we mean, I mean, we mean the, in, as academics, we say reproductive heteronormativity. But the idea of normativity is that, you know, the, that, that men and women, the goal of their life is to get married and reproduce themselves in children and then in grandchildren. So all these images show that I, uh, kind of normativity. I mean, I think that would be the origin of normativity, right? right? Like, but we also see normativity then played out in so many yeah. ways, which is that your life has to proceed by certain milestones. There's only one format by which you can live life. And I think that, you know, it leaves out a host of things which we'll show you in the next slides. So, the, so you can actually, I think, it's no longer something about your orientation or your gender alone. You may choose very normative life or way of being, even while, be, while choosing, a, while, while identifying as a gender that is not the normative gender, or by being of a sexuality which is not the normative sexuality, so to speak. So I think that we now stand at a moment where we are seeing that queerness is a complicated, never fitting into a format kind of idea, right? Always questioning what is normal. So just in being by John, uh, which we just saw, um, his the the idea that he didn't want it's not only that he didn't want to get married, but he also didn't want to get a regular job like his brother. So that we'd see as a questioning of normative structures overall, um, and putting that together with his uh, um, obsession with Salman Khan, we can see how there was there was a queer theme to that to that film. Um, it wasn't necessarily the direction the film wanted to go, but it was. In, in his rejection of all of those st standards of normativity. Uh, you know, actually when I saw Being Bhaijan first, I remember that the filmmaker Madhushri Datta was in the audience and she described the people in the film as beautiful losers. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a gorgeous way to think of us. You may also reject the normative idea of winning, of succeeding, because success is defined by actually getting married, having a job, making money, looking good, Etc. Etc. Right. So that your queerness is all about saying that I don't want to be all those things. You may see me as a loser, but I see myself as beautiful, and I wish to express my beauty through a series of choices that I make in life, which I feel I have the right to make. Uh, the, here are a few slides which tell you ways that people have defined queerness, and this is from a manifesto, actually, a queer manifesto that came out many years ago, many decades ago. And you can see the theme in all of these slides is this: is the re a rejection of normativity in all, all of its forms. So for example, the term gender fuck is not to do with having lots of sex alone, though that it might be included, but the idea that you fuck with gender norms or gender categories and roles. I think what's also very important in this is this thing, a world of pleasure, right? Like this term, a world of pleasure waiting to be explored. And I think fandom in a way is an interest, it, it pinpoints this particular queer experience, that you, you use pleasure as a way of knowing the world and also categorizing and understanding the world and how you're going to live in it. Shall we, should we change the slide? And I think, like for me, this quote is very important because, you know, very often we dismiss many of these things that we're talking about as not being political in a way. That we're talking about fans and fans are just like a crazy bunch of people who are non-serious about life and that talking about this is a non-serious issue. But in a sense, I think what, when we talk about queerness, what we're really saying is, can we understand politics itself differently? Can we start developing new political languages? Can we start understanding how people think and form into groups and even vote in a different way than we've traditionally been doing? So in a way, we are talking about, we, we hope that in the, at the end of this conversation, some of the things that we are talking about vis-a-vis -vis fandom also become metaphorical ways of understanding the way that people identify in the world and that the way that actually people come together as a group and an identity in the world. And that begins from how people see the world, even if sometimes what, it, in fact, fandom opens up that people don't always see the world 
this in, in respectable ways. And I think we've seen that throughout the different films that we have fans that are full of excess. And actually we talk about um, obsessions, the word that we has, you know, has come up in our conversations. Actually the dictionary defines obsession as to be preoccupied or have your mind full of someone or something continually, intrusively, and to a troubling extent. So you can see that the dictionary definition of obsession, we already associate it with something negative, okay? So we when we talk about upset, and I think that, that that's an important part of thinking about non-normative ways, forms of love, okay? So we, we've said this, and, and Paramita has written about this, but when we, you, you know, we, we were allowed to enjoy things to a certain extent, but if we enjoy things too much, that often is seen as inappropriate. So we can all say, oh, we enjoy watching films, but when we see some of the fan activity in the films, we say, oh, but they take it to an extreme. They're obsessed. Or, and you know this, you can post a picture on Instagram of some food you've eaten, and everyone says, oh, great shot. That looks delicious. But if you post a picture of yourself sitting on the couch eating a big bag of chips, people will say, oh, maybe, maybe she shouldn't have posted that. So the idea is that we have implicit ideas of what counts as love and, and enjoy, enjoyment, but they, there's always an implicit limit of what's enjoying too much or going over the edge and being too, being obsessed with something and almost like as if that thing controls you. And I think that's important to talk about when we talk about fandom and it relates to the queerness because I'm saying that basically when you, when you, when you go close to that line of from liking something to liking something too much, you're, you're questioning our rules that govern our behavior and those rules are often associated with normativity. So, uh, uh, I want to tell a, a story about obsessive and unrespectable things, right? Uh, how many people used to, and obviously this is addressed to people under 35, but how many people used to read Mills and Boons when they were young? Or, I mean, there must be some equivalent of that later, right? Like romance novels, watching a lot of rom-coms. So, I, around, I was a very bookish girl, I started reading very early, I was very serious, you know, I got glasses when I was nine years old and everybody in my family started crying like, oh no, what's going to happen? Yeah, so <laughs> we saw what happened, <laughs> all the wrong things. <laughs> but the thing is that, so I was not the type of girl who thought I would read romance novels. I kind of looked down and, on that sort of thing when I was, say, 10. But then when I was 13, possibly due to some hormonal changes, I began reading Mills and Boons. I mean, I read my first Mills and Boons by chance. I still remember it was called Pineapple Girl and it was by Betty Neils. And then from the library, I began to borrow three, four a day. I began to like read them obsessively, right? And my mother began to say like, this is very bad. You're reading too many Mills and Boons. So we all know, we've all heard our parents tell us we are reading too many something or the other. Too many comics, watching too much Netflix. There's always, you're supposed to control all this, these appetites, right? Now, many years later, uh, I met a respectable political feminist type of person who said to me that, you know, my mother used to always say that you shouldn't read so many Muslim books, they'll, they'll uh, ruin your mind. And, and, and I said, they do ruin your mind in the best possible way, right? Because actually, what did the Mills and Moon offer? It offered endless possibility of fantasy. You're continuously in this fantasy world, but you know, once you're in a fantasy world, you don't think that the real world is that interesting. And you start imagining a whole other life, not the life that's in the Mills and Bone, actually. But the capacity for fantasy is strengthened so much that you start thinking, I don't actually have to do what people say I have to do. Maybe I can have a completely different life than the one that we are supposed to lead. So actually, I think listening to music all the time and all of these things, these sensory activities are erotic activities, which make us think, I don't have to be the way people tell me. And that is also why people fear it and try to prevent you from doing it, right? Yeah. I mean, I would just say that even if the men in Mills and Boons don't exist, what's so amazing about men in real life that we had to choose that life, right? We didn't have to. <laughs> and the same can be said for, for um, Bollywood, right? I mean, yeah. That, yeah. That the fantasy. And, and so, again, we, we all know it's fantasy. We all enjoy it. But we, we, we think that enjoying, we need to enjoy it from a certain kind of distance. And I think what we're seeing in, in this film and in... Um, in all of the f films we've seen so far, is that fandom means putting yourself on the line, right? It means actually not saying, I'm gonna see it from a distance. It actually means feeling like you're a part of it and feeling like the thing that's happening around you. Um, we talked about collectivities, but communities are formed when something 
bigger, when you're part of something bigger than you, a fan group bigger than you. I, I mean, I'm also wondering this, you know, that this idea of supposed to see it from a distance. There's something so academic about it, right? The idea that you should live your life not becoming a part of anything. And in some ways, it sort of uh, subscribes to a rational view, right? Like, be rational. How many people have heard this? Like, you're not being rational when you say something that you feel strongly. But I, I want to ask whether being emotional is not a human way to be. It is a human way to be, right? So the idea that you're being emotional is a wrong thing seems to be at the heart also of this idea that you, you should see something from a distance because when you see it from a distance, you're better than it. You're above it. Instead of the idea that because we all feel emotions and we are all led by our emotions or misled by them, whatever, that actually makes us all equally unreliable people. And I'm not sure that I should be telling you what to do because I myself, I'm not very sure what I should do, right? So this instability that it calls up, this idea of being an obsessive, obsessive person or a fan, this instability which eventually, I think it's also the heart of democracy somewhere, that nothing is reliable. Actually, no method is reliable, no person is reliable, and we are, we're all up for questioning somewhere. I think it's really at the heart of it, and people, people feel nervous because fandom is a kind of fluidity in its obsessiveness. It's not a careful, careful way to be. So um, just again, thinking about um, obsession in, in Hindi cinema, um, and you, you get a lot of stories of people, not, not just fans of Hindi cinema, but even within Hindi cinema, you get stories of obsession. And, um, and it's interesting that in so many of the um, films, when you have a character who's obsessed or too filmy, it's often associated with their lack of marriageability. Okay, so you can just think of various examples. Um, Madhuri Dixit banna chahti hu. She's she's obsessed with Madhuri Dixit. She wants to be, and immediately she is she's she has a partner so that she she marries her friend, her best friend, so that they can both go to Bombay together and she can pursue her dreams. But it's not a real marriage, okay? And again, the assumption there is that there's there's something about filminess that resists even. The, the, heter the normativity that is found in marriage. Um, we see the same thing in um, Aya, right, where in the beginning her family is trying to make a marriage uh, prospectus for her and they think, oh, she's very restrained, and then you see her scenes of, you know, going to the beach and singing to herself. And the idea is, again, she's too filmy for marriage. Um, and so, in, and we see this in Om Shanti Om, but, you know, he's, he's obsessed with Shanti Priya, and this, that's one of the rare blockbuster film that doesn't actually end in a marriage or a coupling. Okay, so there's something, um, there's a whole cluster of things about marriageability being opposed to filminess, which suggests to us that filminess poses a threat to marriageability, and again, uh, reminds us of the queerness of, of, fil of filminess, of loving, of cinephilia, of loving film too much that somehow you can't be contained within um, what your parents and what society expects of you. I also think, you know, in the earlier conversation we had, one of the really interesting things you said about this was, yeah, in contrast to the, the rom-com, which is very much focused on getting to the end, that is coupling up and marriage, that you said Hindi films often present marriage as a, as a second best choice. Mm -hmm. The best choice is love, but the second best choice is marriage, and then sometimes you do it because you're required to do it. And that actually the feeling of love, the having or not having love, us experiencing it, when we watch the film, is the more important thing the film is doing. The film is not really telling us, like if you think of yourself watching a film and what you feel the film is telling you to do, older Hindi films especially, like Mukaddar Ka Sikandar is one of my favorite films, right? And it's all about not being able to have love, right? I mean, Rekha loves Amitabh Bachchan, Amitabh Bachchan loves Rakhi, Rakhi loves Vinod Khanna and Vinod Khanna loves Amitabh Bachchan, I guess, right? So, <laughs> I mean, that's how it seems to me. And they're all not able to have each other. And I don't know, every time I hear Oh Saathi Re, I immediately feel like crying and I feel this deep feeling of erotic pain in a way, right? So even in the not having, we are actually experiencing that feeling of love and eroticism more than in the having. So I also think like that was an interesting point you made about the fact that love is the superior idea. And I think... It goes back to an older tradition. And that's why I wanted to show this, uh, this picture of Radha and Krishna. Can anybody tell me what is unusual about it? They, they swap their clothes. They're dressed in each other's clothes, right? And, and I think this is so, such an interesting way for us to think about fandom. If you saw Being Bhaijan, 
earlier today and you see how fans often model themselves as the, as the object of their desire and fandom. And you often have songs which say ke main tumhare rang mein rang jaungi, right, etc. And you, but actually you see that dono ek dusre ke rang mein rang gaya, na? It's like you become the person you desire for a while. There's a playfulness in it. There are so many Hindi film songs also in which this kind of swapping of genders and cross-dressing happens and, and people romance each other. The women dress as men and the men dress as women and then they romance each other or people of the same gender romance each other. So many things happen which are like this, which of course we can understand in terms of orientation and different orientations being incorporated. But I think they also do hark back to this, this tradition of you become so immersed in the object of your love that you become that object, right? So I feel that you also see these older traditions play out in films in many different ways and, and they hark back to the inherent recognition of queerness, of love itself and of desire itself in our culture. And it relates to fandom, the earlier conversation about, you know, the uncle who sings the female part. So what the, the entire, I mean, the playfulness, the, the, sometimes the excess and the irrationality of the entire genre of Bollywood um, allows for kinds of identifications. It's much more open to certain kinds of identifications and mixing and crossing and transgression that you don't see in film that tries to make a, have a political message in a much more neatly packaged form. A lot of this kind of fandom, right? Like where I really love Dharmendra, I, I want to look like Salman, I don't want to get married, Bhai has not got married and I'm also not going to get married because he's shown me the way to be. In a way, these are all different ways of expressing an answer to the question, who am I? Which each one of us asks in different ways. And the more we ask the question, who am I? We are actually questioning the entire construction, social construction of our identities where society has already told us who we are. You are born into this house, you are born into this gender, this is your caste, this will be your role in life. You will go to IIT, IIM, get married, get so much dowry, have two children, and then your wife will of course have to take care of not having more because men don't have vasectomies, right? So the thing is that the, the question who am I versus being told who you are is the fundamentally most radical question of society, right? Because it's from there it begins that we start to question the entire structure. And I think from fans do that through talking about love, of course, talking about pleasure, which is in some senses saying, talking about intuitively knowing about the world. Because when we talk about pleasure and our senses, we are saying we will understand the world from the senses up and not from that so-called rational framework that's been presented to us, right? And that is its political power. Questioning whether love itself is only real or relationships are only real when they are coupled up and involve sex, right? The idea that sex actually exists in different forms or sexualness exists in different forms in all of us is also being raised. That can I love somebody who I already know I'm not going to get? This is seen to be a fallow behavior, right? It's not going to be here. What's the point of loving somebody you're not going to get? But isn't the point of loving also to feel love, to feel desire, to feel excited, to talk to your friends about it, and to, to feel like somebody else when you're in love, right? So I think that both of these things start getting expressed through the way that fandom and marriage and love and desire are expressed. And through that, the queering of relationships, get, relationships gets multiplied. So we are saying already that there are relationships that are normative coupledom. There are relationships that may be erotic friendships, that you can be in love with somebody who is in your mind, you can be in love with somebody you've never met but spoken to on the phone every day, that actually a range of relationships exists, all of which are kind of erotic and pleasurable in different ways, and therefore all are significant at some level or the other. Yeah, this question of requited, it came up in the film earlier, there was that lovely scene where the, the second character was interviewed and said, well, what, you know, would you like to meet Salman? And he said, yes, I would, but then immediately said, oh, but when I make myself a better person in order to meet him. And I think that that sense that we have here of this isn't something, it's not something literal. So there are moments where they wait outside the airport. In the, it, in the Rajnikant, it was interesting, he went to the hospital to have his picture taken in front of the hospital, but it wasn't literally to meet or to requite the, the, the relationship. And so I think that sense of distance of promise mm. that, that, the, that is full of erotic. There's an erotic to promise, to the sense of, of, of you know, living in that moment. 
And again, the, the Hindi film often gives us that by having the, the lover, lovers come together right at the very end. There's, you know, there's never even a sense of like what happens after the lovers come together. You just see them come together, then bust, it's finished. Because the idea is that what you want to watch is all of the thing, all of the erotic pleasure of having before they get together. And once they've gotten together, that erotics is in a sense shifted. But another interesting thing also of what you said right now, I think that, you know, I have to make myself a better person to be that. So I have this ultra thing, but maybe a similar thing where people always say to me, why haven't you met Shah Rukh Khan? Right? After all, you live in Bombay, you can work in films, you're a writer, you could meet Shah Rukh Khan if you wanted. And to which my sincere answer is always, no, it's about Shah Rukh Khan wanting to meet me. It's not about me wanting to meet Shah Rukh Khan. And I know he'll want to do it one day. I don't know how. But in a sense, what are we really doing when we are saying all of these things, we are saying we are becoming something, right? We have made this, we have decided in our minds that this person is looking to us. And we are becoming something under their imagined gaze. So it's really about us defining more and more what we want to be. And the fact that fans eventually find each other is also so interesting, right? That, that obviously it's, it calls up something essentially human, but also essentially shifting in response to the environment that we start expressing what we are feeling vis-a-vis -vis the world and society we live in. And as more and more people express that, as somebody becomes an object of mass fandom and we find each other, we actually reform our society in some very, very fundamental and radical ways. And I think going back to the, the politics of all of this, I think that is where there is significant politics of it. Because when we see, when we talk about fans, there's a tendency to think about it as those people, the masses, people who aren't educated, and then to use all of these, this pre-existing political vocabulary we have to talk about th those people. Mm -hmm. But I think thinking about it this way in terms of becoming opens us up to actually, first of all, not seeing it as those people, but actually seeing that it's entirely continuous with our own processes of becoming that we go through. And also to think about becoming as an active process that everyone's going through, and that might actually give us a new vocabulary to talk about what it means to be in the world, what it means to be Indian, what it means to be, again, voting, who you vote for. I mean, I think the politics of desire in, um, in voting is significant, right? So how can we understand the politics of desire without understanding this question of becoming that is a part of every, every citizen? Yeah. And, and watching this, I'm also thinking, especially thinking about Om Shanti Home as a film, and well, Farah Khan's entire work with uh, Shah Rukh Khan is actually a work of fandom because she loves Shah Rukh. And I think Shah Rukh loves being loved by her. And so they made some like incredibly electric movies together until Happy New Year happened. But the thing is, and I think Happy New Year happened because they both lost belief in that love. But I won't get into my crackpot theories <laughs> right now. Uh, there's only so much crackpotness you can show to the world of your own, right? But I was just thinking that there are also these permissible and not so permissible fandoms, right? Like for example, it's totally permissible to be a fan of a writer. I mean, if you've read all of Amitav Ghosh's books, nobody thinks you're a nutcase. If you've read all his books and every New York article he ever read and go to all his talks, nobody will say, this is a bit too much, yaar. People will approve of it. If you go every year to listen to the classical music season in Chennai, nobody will say that you're obsessed and please calm down. So there are obviously, obviously certain kinds of fandoms that we think are not okay to have. And even with, so by which we mean, popular culture as we call it, but Bollywood or even rock music sometimes, pop music more than rock music. And so even inside that, a caste system gets generated after some time, where the things that boys are crazy fans of, like Comic Con and Star Wars and all these kinds of things, uh, come to have a cult status. But things that women are crazy fans of, like say, bindi fashions and soap operas, or Mills and Boons, etc., always seen as being lesser popular culture. So we can also see that in dismissing fandoms, a kind of entire regime of a hierarchy of elitism is also at play, right? Like what are we allowed to love and what are we not allowed to love? As much as who are we allowed to love and who are we not allowed to love? How are we allowed to love and not allowed to love? And just lastly to say that, you know, so far we often talk about fans as people we have to study, taking from your point about there are people out there and we are not part of them. But what I think it's hard, to talk about, uh, it's hard to talk about fandom without talking about stardom at some point. But it's also interesting to think what is it that fans are feeling to 
think about it seriously and to see what they offer us then as an alternative view of looking at the world. What are they actually teaching us about how we could look at the world through their behavior and through their life choices even? So speaking of Farrakhan, we must go to it. मैंने शाहरुख को बिल्कुल जैसे कोई मेल डायरेक्टर हीरोइन के ऊपर गाना पिक्चराइज करेगा और वो हीरोइन को पानी से निकालेगा या हीरोइन को भिगोएगा मैंने शाहरुख को वैसे ही ट्रीट किया है नॉर्मली यू यूज लेडीज फॉर आइटम सॉन्ग्स बट दिस टाइम दे यूजिंग मैन लाइक आई एम टेलिंग यू यू आर द आइटम गर्ल इन द सॉन्ग सो अगेन वी सी इन दिस कन्वर्सेशन दिस बिहाइंड द सीन्स दैट दैट शी इज वेरी अवेयर ऑफ दिस ऑफ द प्लेफुलनेस ऑफ देयर ऑफ देयर रिलेशनशिप एज यू वर टॉकिंग अबाउट and um again of the of the play with although it seems a, a surprising play that all that seems like a an overly masculine body would reinforce traditional ideas about masculinity actually the way that farakhan has presented it here is actually questioning ideas of masculinity by having his body be as she said featured like the item girl is so often featured and and just to have so much attention on his body and that's something i think also relating to the film earlier today that that we think oh build it body building we think that it's just a reflection of masculinity but in fact that kind of but that kind of attention to the body and and that beautiful beautiful scene where he's looking in the mirror and carefully putting on the makeup to to dress up as Salman Khan i mean i think those are moments of that attention to the body that can't just be reduced i think to masculinity but also brings up a sense of of beauty and of self fashioning through through beauty which i think does in fact question ideas of masculinity uh, when this film came out when the song came out i was obviously very happy and my brother in law would tease me because he began calling sharukh khan sharere khan after mm -hmm. the film came out right and i used to get irritated and people like to always tease me about sharukh khan and say bad things about it and i'm sure all fans know this right like this thing that people will always say bad things about the person you're a fan of and it's a childish kind of thing almost like saying them saying oh tumhara hero itna bekar and you like chup ho jao mere hero ke bare mein kuch mat kaho and i would always saying koi patthar se na mare mere deewane ko really though i am the deewana so far uh, but so i but i think it's interesting how i took a song from lela majnu to talk about this idea right that this this deewan ki you feel and you don't understand and you are no one to tell me what i should feel towards this idol but looking at this interview also makes me think about the earlier thing we were saying about stardom and fandom and about the need that both have for each other right like we understand at some level that the star expresses some unfelt desires of ours like i think that sharukh khan when he emerged he helped all of us in a post liberalization time to make sense of all the new things that were happening our opportunities but also our confusions our desire for a, for some like in a world where it's all about promoting yourself and suddenly it's all about money when it's never been about money but always about nationalism before and there was sharukh khan and he said you can have a new moral compass and that new moral compass will be love it gave us a, it reduced our anxieties i feel it also helped us to be young people in a new world somewhere right so we needed sharukh khan to locate ourselves in the world and i guess sharukh khan needed us to make him whatever he became so i think it's also interesting when he makes a film like fan and sharukh's career has most often traced this idea of obsession of being a fan of wanting to be like the other person like from bazigar to now and when he makes fan i think he plays out this idea of need and the difficulty of need so it's not that we are one can just idealize what the fan does right the fandom carried on for too long can become toxic like its need can become dependence and it indicates that it's time for the world to shift and become something else and i feel that when you see a film like fan you recognize that the globalized freedom that sharukh was celebrating as a figure actually we are seeing right now that it has become toxic and it's not it's full of inequalities it's full of darkness in a way so the relationship of sharukh to the fan is also dark they need each other but we question whether this relationship is necessarily so sunny tempered and positive so there is i think so many different narratives that can be mined from the idea of fan yeah and i think i mean obviously i think that was evident in the film earlier today too that i mean there's that that intense forms of fandom can also reflect um i mean they both are forms of becoming and can reflect a kind of incomplete sense that that society has given enough pathways for for that kind of becoming and in the in the case of the the characters today we we see that they that not having um like as we talked about you know the benefits of globalized india not having reaching reached them then they 
the, their, their forms of becoming get put in a language that isn't quite their own. And so you see that, and, and I think that it's so interesting that Fan was made because it's a very self-reflexive, kind of self-critical um, consideration of something that otherwise people think of as generally, you know, you, you know that Bollywood thinks of as, as, as a good thing, fandom. I mean, it questions Bollywood itself yeah. in some ways, right? And what Bollywood is becoming. I mean, I think also another thing is that when you watch fandom, it gives an indication of what's to come, right? If you observe fan behavior and new fan ships that are occurring, it actually gives you an indication of which way the world is going to go. I mean, the fact that Shah Rukh Khan can't seem to get a hit film tells you something about the fact that Indians are not interested in the heterogeneity that he represents right now. And the fact that there is no star of that level currently and you know, you have a lot of popular young actors and actresses, but nobody's becoming a big star. Also shows that we're in a kind of churning period where we have not actually defined for ourselves what we want next. Ranveer Singh? I don't know. I mean, after his outfit at IFA, I'm worried about his future. <laughs> I'm feeling like it's over. <laughs> yeah, and I really think that what, what we, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's right, thinking about fandom um, in, in that productive way. Rather, and I think that that ideally to try to change the conversation from something that other people do, something that's at a distance, um, and to, I mean, declare ourselves as fans as well, and to actually maybe, you know, take take pride in that rather than being ashamed of it, which goes back to your initial question. Thank you. So I'm very excited to launch this book at India Culture Lab in particular because um, the book is really about the contemporary um, scene in India. It, it tries to look at some of the things that are going on now in literature, and that includes all of the books being written, the romances, the Chetan Bhagats, the, the popular fictions, to try to evaluate that as long as, as well as um, new films. So I talk about um, the new Am Admi films that we've seen um, and how that might relate to a kind of new politics in India. I look at Satyamev Jayate for similarly how it brings together the aesthetic and the political and the filmy and the rational. Um, and I am happy to have a chapter on the work of Paramita Vora, of whom I am a big fan, and I am proudly saying that today. Um, and the, the, it's chapter six looks at um, really everything that she has done, the newspaper columns, the films, the television show Connected Hum Tum, um, and of course, Agents of Ishq, um, to try to look at how, you know, her amazing work is really um, making us think differently about the political and forcing us to think much more broadly about what it means to be political in India today. So um, with her permission, the short excerpt I'm going to read is actually from that chapter in true fan style. And it's actually about... Um, one of the many things she has taught me, but one of the things she has taught me is how to think differently about fandom. So I'm going to read a short um, excerpt from the book that has short excerpts from Paramita's writings on so meta. fandom. It's meta, yeah. Well, I have read the book and I highly recommend it because I think that it actually has very refreshing ways of thinking. Like there were some things which I don't like. For example, I never liked Satyamev Jayate, but I was forced to reconsider how it works when I read the book and it's a great discussion of a film called Main Azad Hoon, which I love, so I recommend that you buy it. Thank you. Okay, so this is from a section called The Critic and the Fan, um, from the chapter on, um, on Paramita's work. Um, page. So I'm discussing her fandom of Bollywood superstar Shah Rukh Khan, known for his romantic roles and also derided by many critics and intellectuals for his form formulaic and cheesy on-screen persona, unlike, for instance, the more serious demeanor of Amir Khan, a star whom Bora deems appealing only, quote, if you're vegan. But it is precisely for this reason that Bora prefers Shah Rukh Khan. She argues that, quote, to track the on-screen journey of Shah Rukh Khan is to track the journey of a certain middle-class India which has not partaken of Nehruvian India's structures for mobility, those whose entrepreneurial energies, frustrated by older systems, took center stage in the new regime of liberalization. But that, she concedes, might be too literal an interpretation. Quote, perhaps it is more fruitful to understand Shah Rukh Khan as one does a dream, a mixture of the explicit, reflecting social and economic currents, 
and the implicit, a mix of unconscious feelings that infects our consciousness and transforms it. For a new generation of Indians, Shah Rukh Khan gave us someone to love, someone to love our way, someone to long for, someone to conceivably be. The moral compass Shah Rukh Khan provided was love. This was not simply romantic love, but a concept that developed individual ethical frameworks, allowing us to look at the opposition with loving eyes, that takes others into consideration. The character Shah Rukh Khan played find their better selves through love, using it to find new resolutions and solutions. In this kind of masculinity, there is room for women beyond being objectified or uplifted by men. In this universe, a woman with ambitions is not weird, selfish, or unfeminine, but natural and desirable. She is not domesticated by marriage, but partnered through fun and sexual passion. With this fantasy of a passionate yet light romance, Shah Rukh Khan has pleasured and ruined a generation of women while making them open to a whole other kind of man. When pressed in an interview on her love of Shah Rukh Khan, Vora responds, Shah Rukh Khan is like a catalyzing rasa that exists in the world that makes you feel sexy. He is the mechanism that turns you on, not necessarily for him, for you to experience desire. How many things in this fucking world are made for women to experience desire? You tell me, you can count them on one hand. Thank you. Several scholars and journalists Several scholars and journalists have written about fandom in Indian cinema, but what distinguishes Vora's take is how she writes herself simultaneously as fan rather than as distance sociologist of fandom in general. This is again apparent in an article on the Pakistani-born Bollywood star Fawad Khan. Vora begins the piece by affirming that she is still loyal to Shah Rukh Khan, even though recently he seems to have turned his gaze elsewhere. According to her, Fawad Khan has many of the same qualities as Shah Rukh Khan, he is comfortable sharing space with women characters. He seems comfortable being a character rather than replaying an archetype, which makes him feel accessible, touchable, real. But it's not just that. Quote, he's hot with those soft brown eyes and spiky eyelashes and slow smile. You might almost, almost never notice his hotness until you suddenly do and then you notice little else. His eyes have both mystery and mischief and many other things you could spend a while observing. His manner is composed, controlled, as if he keeps his own counsel and is in no hurry to decide anything or show you what he's all about. Like he's in no hurry for you to decide and is totally secure giving you some space. If you matched with Fawad on Tinder, he would not ask you, what are you looking for on Tinder? He'll be perfectly capable of taking this time to figure it out with you. His delicate beauty lends vulnerability and at the same time he seems absolutely together, able to take care of himself not asking you to be his mother or be like his mother, not blaming you for his broken heart, not trying too hard to impress. In other words, he seems grown up. Most writings on Fawad Khan focus on the fact that he's a Pakistani actor in Bollywood and thus represents headway in overcoming the two nations' enmity despite a recent politically motivated ban on Pakistani artists working in India. But for Vora, this is the least interesting fact about him. The first line of this article begins, let me just say this very simply, okay, without any cultural studies, costume, and Amanji Asha accessories. In this comment, preconceived ideas of both progressive politics and cultural analysis are discarded from the outset, clearing the way for a new kind of engagement with contemporary culture outside these dominating discourses, one predicated on not only female desire, but the desiring critic. As we see in Vora's comments about Dam Lagake Haisha, for Vora, political righteousness does not translate into the ability to represent love or desire. In fact, it might impede it. Here, too, the question of India-Pakistan peace is discarded for a more libidinal engagement across a different kind of border. What does it mean for the critic to subject herself in this way in her writings? Criticism tends to operate on an established but rarely articulated distance between the writer and the object of her representation. We can see how in Barth's terms, this distance is generative of a textual frigidity. But what if criticism were to come from and enter inside the object itself? It would dismantle, as Vora's works so often do, the assumed hierarchies between writer and critic and between object and observer, just as Shah Rukh Khan and Fawad Khan open up space in their films for a multiplicity of desires. This is the general modality of Vora's work as a whole. Her writings on Bollywood do not ask to be read as merely commentary, but as a kind of submission or radical humility. By putting her own libidinal self on the line, as it were, she presents the object anew. Desire becomes the prerequisite for criticism, rather than something criticism can merely explain.